Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Ultimate Persona Compendium. Even though both games shared a lot of the same development team, there is a huge difference between the first and second Persona games. The first game was highly experimental. It's difficult to stress just how different it was from anything else at the time. It had some familiar elements that Megami Tensei fans would recognise. But for the most part, it was a whole of a beast. Exploring themes that had never really been touched on in a JRPG before. This experimental nature led to creativity that we're still talking about to this day. Or at least I am. But with the first game in any franchise, there's going to be some elements that are simply left behind by the sequels. We've seen this time and time again. In Persona 1's case, it would be the entire battle system. Possibly for many of the reasons we looked at in part 2 of the Persona 1 analysis. Innocent Sin's design shed some of the holdovers from the mainline Shin Megami Tensei games. First of all, we no longer have first-person dungeons. First person in general has been completely abandoned in favour of this 3D top-down view. This was also used in the first game for cutscenes and areas without random encounters. But in Innocent Sin, it becomes our primary view of everything. It's been greatly improved in many ways though. The environments are no longer pseudo-3D backgrounds. They're entirely 3D now, which allows you to change the camera angle. The characters remain as 2D sprites though, keeping with the separation between the 2D and 3D elements that was present in the first game. This is an aesthetic choice that gives Persona 2 an identity distinct from its ancestors. This is, after all, the series that is based more around characters, as opposed to claustrophobic dungeons. With this being said, it still has a heavy emphasis on random encounter battles like the first game. And this is where the most significant changes to the gameplay can be found. Innocent Sin's battle system can be summed up as familiar, yet completely different. The first thing you'll notice is that characters and enemies are now much more dynamic while fighting. The battlefield isn't split into two halves anymore and no one is bound to an invisible grid. The positioning of characters is simply for show this time around. The player never has to take range into account. A physical attack is as effective right next to an enemy as it is two screens away. Because of this change, area attacks are no more. It's been replaced by group targeting skills instead. This hits all enemies of a certain group, Basically, all duplicates of the same enemy. Which means it's only as good as a single targeting attack when every enemy in a battle is unique. There are some exceptions to this though. Such as every part of Nyalafotep counting as the same group. This new system ensures that you'll never have a character that's unable to attack because of their positioning or loadout. In fact, characters now only have one physical attack as opposed to having both a sword and gun attack. There are five types of physical damage. Sword, range, strike, thrown and havoc. Tatsuya has a sword, Lisa has martial arts strikes, Mayu and Akichi have ranged guns, and Yukino and Jun have throwing weapons. All of these can be obtained via persona skills, just like in the first game. This is the only method of using the Havoc line of physical damage as well. The elemental skills have had some small changes, but are the same for the most part. We have a new element, water, which is completely different from ice. It was more than likely put into the game to tie into Jun's Aquarius symbol, the Water Bearer. To account for this extra element, gravity and blast skills now fall under the Almighty class. Innocent Sin's battle system has a different flow to most turn-based JRPGs of the time. 
Instead of selecting each character's actions at the beginning of the turn and then letting the battle play out, we have what could only be described as an auto battle menu. The strategy menu allows you to select each character's actions in any order you wish, and start battle will repeat these actions until you cancel it. You can interrupt the turns at any time, and the new turn order will be reflected in the strategy menu. You can manipulate this turn order yourself. Although you can't make your slowest character go before your fastest without also putting them at the back of the turn order, giving enemies the advantage. But why would you ever need to do this? Well, there's a new mechanic called Fusion Spells. These will activate automatically when skills are used in a certain order by two or more characters. Everybody. Early in the game, they're relatively simple. Using any two fire skills back to back will produce an extra powerful fire attack. You can also use these to create full party healing skills and buffs that can't be obtained any other way. You're left to your own devices to discover most of these though. Unless you're working from the Japanese strategy guide, it'll be complete chance if you're able to find some of the more complicated ones. Once used though, they'll be logged in the fusion spell menu for future reference. You can even disable or automatically turn on any fusion spell you want, if you wish to forego the game asking you every time. I'll go into a little bit more detail about these mechanics later, as they were changed for the PSP version. But for now, let's continue on with something more familiar. Demon Negotiations Make a Return as usual, it's something you can choose to engage in if you wish to avoid combat or swindle items. Each demon has a unique series of character quirks and respond differently depending on which party member speaks to them. Your party members have their own approach to speaking with demons, not too dissimilar to the first game, but this time you can partner two or three characters together for a different result. Getting Lisa, Mayu, and Yukino together will result in the ladies trying to seduce the demons with their feminine wiles. Something quite similar happens when Jun replaces Yukino in the party, which massively alters your repertoire of contacts. You gain more of these unique interactions as the characters grow closer over the course of the narrative. But not all of them are useful. Some of these interactions will simply end with the characters bickering and forcing you to negotiate with one of them. This is a sort of penalty for not remembering which characters are good at cooperating with each other. The demons themselves might also take the initiative and contact you first. Unlike the first game, you don't have the option to turn them down. The most important thing to be gained from these negotiations is tarot cards. Much like spell cards in the first game, these are needed for creating new personas at the Velvet Room. The similarities stop there, however. The spell cards of the first game functioned much like Megami Tensei demons. Once you had two of them, they could be fused together to create a persona. This isn't the case in Persona 2. Every demon has an arcana, and when you're able to make them eager enough, they'll give you a number of tarot cards of that arcana. The higher the demon's level, the more cards you'll receive. Cards now function more like a currency than fusion material. They can be taken to the Velvet Room in exchange for new personas from the 22 major arcana. You'll need a sufficient number of tarot cards of the same arcana as the persona you wish to summon. Not all of these can be found through demon negotiation though, at least not directly. While there is at least one demon for every major arcana, excluding Fool, not all of them are willing to hand over their cards. In this case, you'll need to request that the demon painter create these for you in exchange for free tarot cards. Free tarot cards are gotten the same way you collect regular tarot cards, only you must first form a contract with a demon by making it happy. This is something it may decline if you're too low level. Make a demon you have a contract with eager and you'll have free tarot cards. The Demon Painter is one of the Velvet Room's new denizens in this game. 
Like Tadashi Satomi before him, this is an in-game cameo from one of the game's creators, Kazuma Kaneko. Not only does he borrow his appearance, but he also seems exceptionally skilled at drawing Megaten demons, like the legend himself. There are a number of secret personas that the game doesn't really tell you about. The Fool Arcana makes a return, but it's now much more difficult to obtain. Personas of this Arcana can't be created for a fusion accident like they could in the first game. They can only be summoned using the Fool cards, which can be found through extremely rare demon negotiations. The method is to have a demon ask you four questions in total, by either angering them or making them eager. These are the only emotions that prompt further questions. If the fourth question results in eager, there'll be a 1 in 32 chance of a fifth fool question. Answering this question in a foolish way will, finally, get you a single fool card. Subsequent attempts will instead have a 1 in 16 chance of triggering the fool question. This is such an arduous grind that it's not something I'd recommend doing, at all. In the words of a wise man, they're for fools, after all. It's also worth noting that these are the only major arcana cards that cannot be created by the Demon Pater. This is explained in-universe by a subtle bit of dialogue in the London Clothes Store, when you speak to the middle-aged artist. He says that the reason the Demon Pater can't capture the essence of the Fool is because it's the most human of the arcanas. It is, after all, the only arcana not found among demons. According to the official strategy guide, the Demon Pater was a human who became infatuated with drawing demons. One day, he painted a door to the Velvet Room and vanished from this world, becoming trapped in the collective unconscious. Only when he can paint a fool will he leave. The Fool represents true freedom and independence. The Fool is the protagonist who must venture through the other arcana to arrive at the end of his journey. The World. It only makes sense that your main obstacles throughout the game represent the stepping stones on this journey, and why it belongs to the protagonists and no one else. The story of the Demon Painter is an ironic one. He's a human who cannot capture what it means to be human. Maybe this is a sly commentary on how Kaneko is most well known for rendering the series trademark creatures. Earlier, I made sure to specify that this is the only major arcana the Demon Painter can't create, because technically he can't paint the minor arcana either. Personas of the minor arcana can only be created through mutations, Mutations are a new mechanic to Persona 2. They can occur when a battle is finished with a fusion spell, although the effect differs depending on the Persona's rank. The frequency of mutations is influenced by Persona compatibility. With normal compatibility, there's a 1 in 32 chance of mutation, and with best compatibility, it's reduced to 1 in 8. The effects include increased stats, jumping up two ranks, learning a new skill, and being able to mutate into a new persona entirely, either into a persona of the major arcana or one of the aforementioned minor arcanas. The minor arcana includes pentacle, cup, sword, and rod. Another new mechanic to Persona 2 is the rumor system. We've already seen what role this plays in the plot of Innocent Sin, but now it's time we delve into how it ties into the gameplay. The player can spread their own rumors at the Kuzunoha Detective Agency. Todoroki will spread your first rumor for free, but everything after that will cost you. Since rumours become reality in Sumaru, this is highly advantageous to the party. Unfortunately, since our heroes don't seem to have the best imaginations, rumours need to be collected before they can be spread. There are several key rumour monger characters that will help you with this. 
Toro Toku Chika Lisumaru Jini, and last, but certainly not least, Baofu, who can be spoken to through his website at Double Slash. The rumours you hear from these characters can expand and optimise your options when purchasing new equipment. The following options can be found for stores. Quality and prices are normal. Quality is good, but it's expensive. They're cheap, but low quality. Selection's good, but the buyback price is low. Selection's bad, but the buyback price is high. It's designed in a way to be balanced and force a player to think about which stores they want to optimise. Ideally, you want a store that will give you the best quality equipment, and a store that will give you the most money when pawning your old equipment. Think carefully, because you can only choose one of these per location, and your choice can't be reverted. Why do characters can't just spread a rumour that gives them both good quality equipment and high buyback is, again, down to their poor imaginations. This same balance can be observed in the sweepstakes and casino rumours. For the sweepstakes, you can speak with Tamaki and have her send off your magazines to enter. You can later collect your winnings, or lack thereof, from Steven Silverman, and the stakes will be higher depending on the rumour you spread. It can be easy to win with bad prizes, hard to win with normal prizes, and extremely hard to win for great prizes. For the casino, you can spread a rumour that will increase the payout for either blackjack, poker, or the slots. The rest of the rumours, at least the ones at the detective agency, are related to the various side quests you can undertake for the people of Sumeru. These usually involve someone claiming to have seen some kind of mysterious creature, and asking you to bring back some proof that it exists. This can only be done by finding said creature and slaying them. However, none of them are actually real so they need to be brought to life using rumours. Let's go through all of them, and when and where in the game they can be found. The first of these can be found right at the start of the game, in the first dungeon. Speak to this student in Classroom 2B, and he'll tell you that he saw Hanako, but nobody believes him. Hanako is a real-life Japanese ghost story about a little girl who haunts school bathrooms. Sure enough, this demon attacks you from inside a toilet. The next rumour is named Bukimi, and is also based on the Hanako urban legend. You hear about her from the effeminate male student on the third floor of Kasugiyama High. Toilet demons are a recurring theme in this game, if you haven't noticed. The next rumour can be heard about at the Conan Police Department from a kid. He says there's a creature called a dresser hag in the abandoned factory. It's the ghost of an old woman who attacks you from inside a dresser. Outside Alba Park is a man who tells you about someone who can speak to flowers. This rumour allows all of the flowers in Alba Park to speak to you and ask questions. Depending on your answers, you may get items, but you're just as likely to get damaged or poisoned. Also in Alba Park is the rumour demon Linda, the ghost of a singer who got lost on her way to a concert and starved to death. The maniac in Shiraishi Ramen is a fan of hers and wants you to bring back some memorabilia. He gets more than he bargained for since you end up giving him her bra. The next rumour demon can be heard about from Fuyuko at Peace Diner. She'll tell you a scary story about a cursed taxi that runs people over on its own. She claims to have seen it herself at the abandoned factory. The first one of these you encounter isn't the one she's talking about though. It's actually a cursed escort that she's looking for. The next one can be heard about from the old man playing dumb in Rendigai. This one is another real-life Japanese urban legend. Kuchisake Ona, the evil spirit of a woman who wears a mask to hide her gaping split mouth. She can be found at Mount Iwato, 
while you have the evil Maya in your party. Just like the urban legend, she'll ask you if you think she's pretty. Although, you have no choice but to fight her anyway. At the base of Mount Katsumori is a hiker who claims to have seen the Jumping Geezer, a strange entity that is constantly jumping. It's actually just the shrine's head monk training in the forest, and being mistaken for a cryptid by hikers. This one is your first rumour demon with Jun in the party. Speak to the pale man at Sumaru TV and he'll tell you that he's been rattled by a scary story he heard. All we know is that there's something called Kudan at the abandoned factory. Kudan is a mythical Japanese creature that resembles a cow-human hybrid. They're said to speak of dark prophecies of misfortune before promptly dying. They're very much a bad omen. And this is exactly what he is in the game as well. So under no circumstances should you spread the rumour of his presence. But if you do, you'll find that Kudan has an ability called Prophecy, that will reduce all of your party's persona ranks back to one, before promptly dying. And even when you do defeat the demon, the Pale Man has no reward for you. He never promised one in the first place. This entire side quest is like a trap for unsuspecting players. The Pale Man was actually just talking about a friend named Kudan that he met at the abandoned factory. He was given the nickname Kudan because he had floppy ears like a cow. This is a reminder that rumours are a powerful and dangerous thing, not to be taken lightly. The final rumour side quest has been saved for last because it's the most expansive. It revolves around the game's optional dungeon, the Abandoned Factory. As you progress through the game, you'll unlock more rooms in the building to explore, each one with progressively higher level enemy encounters. This location is meant to act as a grind dungeon of sorts, that allows a player to encounter all of the game's bestiary again, since you're unable to revisit previous dungeons. It's the same thing as the Makage Ruins from the first game, but there's additional endgame content here that makes it a bit more interesting. Your reward is the legendary weapons. You can find notes scattered around the factory by its former employees, most of them chronicle the early appearance of demons by eyewitness reports, but one in particular hints at a secret location within the building. A hidden boardroom that an employee had to be blindfolded to enter. To further this plot, you have to make a contract with a demon and ask them for more information. This normally leads to the demons telling you about special rumour skills that some demons have such as Jack Frost's Atomic Bufula, or Pyrojack's Dynamic Aguilau. But in this instance, you can hear about a hidden passageway behind a switchboard in the factory. These types of rumours can only be spread by the demons themselves, so you need to contact them a second time and make a request. Once the rumour of the secret passageway becomes real, you can enter the executive suite. Here you'll find a familiar face, K. Nanjo. He's investigating a rumour that a man who resembles Kandori was sighted near the factory. After speaking to him, he'll hand you his legendary sword. After this, you'll be able to drop down a hole near the entrance of the factory. In this room, you'll find a report about the waste treatment plant the rumoured origin point of all of the demons in the building. Have a demon spread the rumour, and this part of the factory will also become available. At the end of this long labyrinth is yet another familiar face. Reiji Kido, the man who had been mistaken for Kandori. Now that he's older, his appearance does bear a similarity to his villainous half-brother. He'll be extremely offended if you tell him this, but regardless, he'll hand you the legendary gloves. 
This brings a close to the mystery of the abandoned factory, but there's still a few legendary weapons left to find. It's worth mentioning that the following can be done before or after completing the abandoned factory. The order in this video is not the only one. The remaining legendary weapons require the player to keep asking demons for information. Eventually, the following rumours will be heard. There are legendary weapons at Shiraishi Ramen and Claire de Lune. Mam will only sell you the legendary case if Akichi tries her yogurt ramen, and Garçon Sojima will only sell you the legendary gun if Maya tries his experimental spaghetti. For the last legendary weapon, speak to the kid behind the Alia Shrine, and then read the bulletin board at Honmaru Park. It speaks of someone searching for the legendary flower, and that it's apparently being held at Time Castle. If you drop by Time Castle, you'll find some customer's myth that the Count doesn't have it. From here, you can speak to all of the rumour mongers for a different rumour on what happened to it. But the best rumour to spread is the one you hear from Baofu, where the Count gave it away to a woman as a gift. Sure enough, this woman turns out to be Maki Sonomura, who is more than happy to give it to you for free. This completes the symbolic passing of the torch of the Persona 1 cast to the Persona 2 cast. ...1999年から熱狂的なファンに今もなお愛され続けている。噂を操るRPG。2011年、今、蘇る。while the quality more than makes up for it, the quantity of content in Innocent Sin is much less than the previous game. There's no expansive side story parallel to the main game that challenges the player. There aren't any alternate endings either. Possibly so players weren't left confused when Eternal Punishment released. That's not to say there are no more choices to be made in the game, they just no longer lead the player to an unsatisfying conclusion. Choice is used to deliver a very stern message to the player in this game. Sometimes it's better to let others solve their own problems. They must confront their shadow in order to grow stronger as people. They must complete their journey of individuation. In the previous part, we looked at how this is a lesson that can be taken away from Jun's story, but it's just as prevalent in other parts of the game as well. When Akichi is being assaulted at Club Zodiac by Sugimoto and his gang, the player can either intervene or watch things play out. Intervening will lead to a boss fight, but watching things play out will reveal that Akichi is more than capable of defusing the situation on his own. Something very similar happens at the concert hall when Lisa is being tempted to join the mass circle by Ginji. Akichi will plead with you to save Lisa from Ginji. Doing so will lead to a very difficult boss fight with only three party members. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, everyone. Wait, is it over? However, choosing to wait will allow you to fight him later at full strength. Maya's fear of fire makes her reluctant to jump down to save Akari when the museum is burning down. You can have Tatsuya jump down to save her instead, or force Maya to brave the flames. In each scenario, the latter option is the path of least resistance, and also rewards you with the special Prime Personas. At Mount Iwato, the party finds themselves reminiscing of their past friendship at the Shrine. There are rooms that contain their masks from their time as the Mass Circle, the ones they swore to lock away and never speak of again. If they collect these masks, essentially choosing to face their past, they'll be rewarded with the Ultimate Personas by Philemon. 
This is slightly different with Yukino, of course, since she doesn't share the same past. Her ultimate persona can be gained if Tatsuya stops her from wallowing in grief over Shunsuke's death. Finally, these ultimate personas can be evolved one more time if they're used during each character's respective Zodiac Temple boss. This will nullify their weakness against dark magic. No works of darkness shall bar our path. Or, in Jun's case, this will allow him to mutate into his ultimate persona. He doesn't face a shadow doppelganger here like the others. Instead, he faces the elite soldiers of the last battalion, who symbolize his heinous acts committed as Joker. So by facing their shadows, they can resist the dark. This is just a fantastic example of the game's themes being conveyed through mechanics alone. There are no choices that will doom you to a bad ending because, as we already know, that happens anyway. But the character's journey to individuation is left up to you. As previously mentioned, Innocent Sin on the PS1 never saw a Western release but its 2011 PSP remaster did. If you've been following this series, that might fill you with apprehension, as the PSP remaster of Persona 1 was less than ideal. It had plenty of issues that prevented it from being the definitive version of the game. It had missing sound effects and a completely new soundtrack. It gave the sense that the artistic vision of the original game had been compromised somewhat. Fortunately, both of these mistakes were avoided with Innocent Sin. There are some very minor sound effect changes in places, such as the menu sounds. The strangest, perhaps, is this clownish cancel sound, but nothing particularly important. Menu sounds are menu sounds. The music also remains intact. A lot of the original tracks have been remixed to give them a more modern sound, but the tracks themselves are pretty much the same. Most importantly, you can choose to play with the original music if you wish. However, there are some newly added tracks that can't be turned off, and this is because they have no equivalents in the original game. These include actual title screen music, level up music, an instrumental version of the game's theme song, which I played at the end of part one and a song called Unbreakable Tie that plays during the new opening animation. This song stands out the most as it's another attempt by Atlas to give the game a more modern persona feel. It includes rapping from Lotus Juice, whose vocals were heavily featured in Persona 3. The rest of the new music is exclusive to the newly added content, which we'll get into a little later. You might also notice that the game's UI has been overhauled quite a bit. 
Some menus are now much simpler, easier and faster to use. It's the kind of improvements you'd expect from a port with a decade of hindsight. It features many of the same quality of life enhancements as the PSP version of Persona 1, such as battle animation skipping and affinity icons. Plus, there's a helpful turn order timeline. The new menus definitely have a different flavour, with a heavy emphasis on the colour red. This was probably to match Persona 3 and 4's emphasis on the colours green and yellow, respectively. Sadly, it comes at the expense of the customizable menus from the PS1 version, yet again. But the menus do feature brand new portraits of the characters to make up for it. We even have these slick new cutting animations during fusion spells. You could probably criticise these for slowing down the fusion spells, but the fact that you can turn them off makes it a non-issue. So, is this the definitive version of Persona 2 Innocent Sin? Unfortunately, no. While it does avoid many issues that plagued the Persona 1 PSP port, it actually creates some of its own. The positive changes implemented into the UI come at a hefty price. The complete ruination of the battle system. The original battle system, as I mentioned earlier, isn't like an ordinary JRPG. It was set up with auto-battling in mind. The original game allowed you to go into the strategy menu and change each individual character's actions. This simple process has been needlessly complicated for the PSP redesign. All of the rules that govern the PS1 version are still in place, but it's using a more traditional battle system. One that requires you to pick each character's actions before the battle can begin, and ends when all of their actions have been taken. This can deceive players into thinking that there's no way of stopping battles partway through, which is a vital strategy in your arsenal. The original battle system made this obvious, because there was never a point where the battle would stop itself without player intervention. Well, unless a player goes into the strategy menu and changes it to single turns. But this wasn't the default. The default was a battle that would flow seamlessly. There was no clear beginning or end to the turn order. But again, the PSP version also works in this way. It's just hidden by this needless requirement that you choose everyone's actions at the start of the turn order. Let's say you only want to change one character's action. Let's say Akichi, whose low agility often puts him at the back of the turn order. You can't just go in and only change Akichi's action like you could in the PS1 version. So your only option is to reselect everyone's actions until you finally get to him. You can get past this repetition by pressing triangle and switching it onto auto. But this is only if your auto settings were set to replay and not attack. Otherwise, you end up with everyone doing physical attacks instead of their last selected actions. Which will actually replace your settings for the last selected actions, requiring you to reselect them all yet again. This is a mistake I found myself making quite often. Furthermore, why does it even need an all battle menu when the original battle system already functioned like one? It almost feels like it was redesigned to be more like Persona 1's battle system, where turns had clear beginning and ends and couldn't be interrupted. But somebody at Atlas got cold feet and decided not to do this. So what we have is a solution to a problem that didn't exist and breaks what wasn't broken. But why would they ever do this? It's possible that this was considered because of a hidden strategy that you can use to make the game much easier. You could even go as far as saying it's an exploit. An exploit so deeply ingrained into the battle system that it simply cannot be removed. But it's just as likely that it's a valid strategy that the player was always intended to use. We can't be sure either way. I'm referring to something I call defense spamming.
defense is your only option when all of your attacks are ineffective. As you might expect, defense lessens damage taken from enemies. What you might not expect, however, is that defense doesn't require a turn to take effect. As long as the character is set to defend, they will defend. No matter where in the turn that happens. It can be right after a character has already taken an action. So long as the very next turn doesn't belong to an enemy. The result is a battle system that can be turned into a cakewalk. Provided you have the patience to set everyone, or almost everyone, to defend before every turn. This is present in both the PS1 and PSP versions. Only it's much more inconvenient in the latter because of the repetitious and sluggish menus. That's another problem in this version. The menus move a lot slower than they did originally. Sluggish menus aren't really an issue in most games, but in a game that predominantly uses them for battle, it becomes incredibly grating. And speaking of slowdown, battle animations have a tendency to do this as well. I'm afraid the issues don't stop there either. Just like we saw with Persona 1, the difficulty's been lowered. This is a strange choice given that the original wasn't that hard to begin with. The fact that you could save anywhere outside of battles, with a few exceptions, meant that you were never in danger of losing much progress. Now difficulty is virtually non-existent. Enemies and bosses are significantly less deadly. The only reason you'd ever lose a party member in this version is if you get hit with a hammer or moodle spell. Even the time limit in some sequences has been greatly relaxed. You no longer have the 30 minute countdown during the Genji Suzaki boss. The countdown now only begins after you start looking for the explosives. And even then, not during enemy encounters or when you're exploring rooms. This also happens when the Aerospace Museum is set ablaze. You no longer have to dispatch enemies as quickly as possible. There's another thing that the PSP version is infamous for. It's something even a lot of people who haven't played the game know about. Hitler with sunglasses. The original game has been censored worldwide. Possibly because the PSP version had to be rated by Zero this time around the Japanese Video Game Rating Board. Something that didn't exist when the original game was released. This means that Hitler has been renamed to the Führer, and all swastikas have been replaced with the German Iron Cross. But it's not just Nazi imagery that's been removed. During Anna's introduction, she lights a cigarette, to the dismay of both Noriko and Yukino. This is meant to establish her as someone who has seemingly given up on her future. Yukino taking the cigarette from her also establishes their relationship. The PSP version changes this scene to remove the cigarette entirely, but Noriko still scolds her about ruining her health making it a bit confusing. There are also some floor textures changed in places, but aside from the obvious swastika floor when fighting Hitler, these likely had nothing to do with censorship. The first encounter with Joker originally had a backdrop of a purple quaternity. It was changed to a much less abstract one, one that resembles the actual location the fight takes place in. You can see similar changes made throughout the game, such as the floor in Seven Sisters High. In a weird reverse of this design choice though, is the Yasuo boss fight, which now looks less like a rooftop than it did originally. And then we have the backdrop changes that were done simply because they didn't look that good in the original game, not to account for the wider aspect ratio. The Hanya boss now has these 3D rotating gears instead of the static gears texture, 
and added to every battle are the psychedelic moving backdrops. They weren't in the original game, but they did show up in Eternal Punishment, and this is probably why they were added. The Western release got its own exclusive changes, but only for the new mode, the Climax Theater. This allowed you to create your own custom quests, at least you could in the Japanese version anyway. It's cut content in the Western release, for reasons that an Atlas PR manager cited as technical challenges. However, you can still visit the Climax Theater and play the pre-made quests that come with the game. They feature new artwork, music, characters and bosses seen nowhere else in the game. The first couple of these have you going on a trip to St. Hermelin High so Maya can interview one of the popular teachers. What entails is a complicated narrative about a website that's turning students into their ideal selves, using the spirit of a deceased girl. The third and final quest mission takes place at Karukozaka High, the setting of Shin Megami Tensei If. The party is given a mission from Nameless of the Velvet Room to solve a mystery at the school. This leads them to Wayland and Nirasawa, two students that have been stealing personas from people so that they can summon the Archangel Kushiel. These missions feel completely different from anything in the main game, and that's because they weren't written by Tadashi Satomi. As a result, I can't really say they're of the same quality as the main game. It's hard to take it seriously as anything other than non-canon fluff. They even use Maya's dying portrait for a cheap joke, which is just tasteless. It's filled with significant amounts of fan service though, and a kind of funny ending where all the characters break the fourth wall. There are other quests besides these and the player created ones. There are a number of DLC quests that could be downloaded from the PSN store. Some of these are special collaborations between Atlas and game magazines for promotion. But the most interesting of these is the Shadow Trilogy, which actually was written by Tadashi Satomi. This gives them far more legitimacy than the ones that come bundled with the game. It acts as a bridge between Persona 1 and 2. Unfortunately, they're untranslated and not playable outside the Japanese version. So we have censorship, slowdown, an inferior battle system, and added content of dubious quality. It's not exactly definitive, but it's the only official option for English-speaking players. Innocent Sin was extremely relevant for the time it was released. It dealt with a great deal of doomsday prophecies that were popular towards the end of the millennium. The story itself plays with this fascination of prediction and prophecy. The significance of the year 1999, the final year of the millennium. It has an inherent fascination. Innocent Sin is a time capsule of this period in time. That isn't to say it's dated though. Rather, its astrological and historic references makes it timeless. You can decide on your own which version of the game you should play. But no matter what you pick, the brilliance of Persona 2 Innocent Sin shines through. Next time, we'll look at the final entry in the classic Persona trilogy the second half of the Persona 2 duology, Persona 2 Eternal Punishment. Until we meet again. <laughs> I need them! Are you tired of working a dead-end job with no sick days, no vacation, massive overtime, and extremely humid conditions? 
I know I am! Call 555-0416 Sachi today, and you'll be put through to the game library, where I, Sachiko, will beg for your help!